Hello, everyone. Great to see that you are all here in such large numbers. Um, I would like to ask you to squeeze towards the middle, sit a little closer to each other, because uh, it can be that there will be people late. Um, but other than that, I wish you welcome here in Erasmus Pavilion. My name is uh, Lenja Slierendrecht, and I work as program manager for Studium Generale. So I organize lectures like today, but we do many other events, as you could have seen here on the uh, PowerPoint behind me. And you can follow us on socials uh, through SG Erasmus. Today we are gathered for a lecture on Hannah Arendt. War, oppression and unrest. In an age characterized by complex social issues, political turbulence and technolo technological progress, Hannah Arendt's ideas seem more relevant than ever. She is best known for concepts such as banality of evil, the human condition, and the roots of totalitarianism. When she developed her theories, fascism took over Germany and the Soviet Union became a totalitarian state under, St under Stalin. What lessons can we learn from Arendt for today's challenges? So it is time for an introduction to one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century, by none less than Professor Dr. Marley Heyer. Professor Dr. Marley Heyer is Professor of Public Philosophy at Erasmus School of Philosophy, Chair of Stichting Maand van de Filosofie, which could be translated as Philosophy Month, a columnist for daily newspaper Trouw, and former Denker des Vaderlands. Heyer's research focuses on the philosophy of man and culture. She is particularly interested in the question of how people come to order, for example, the organization of time. And, and that's the most relevant for today, she's an expert on Hannah Arendt. Give her a warm hand of applause, Professor Dr. Marley Heyer. Thank you very much, uh, Lenia. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, Lenia said already, we're living in turbulent times. Um, what seemed impossible in the Netherlands happened last November. The Dutch party for freedom, the PVV, a populist far-right party uh, which attacks the fundaments of the democratic rule of state, rule of law, rechtsstaat in het Nederlands, won the elections. Many Dutch citizens and also many European leaders fear this success, fear this success because it might give an impetus to the popularity of far-right parties in other countries, and thus contributing to the worldwide advance of populist movements, populist parties, and populist leaders, and the sub simultaneous decline of liberal democracies. Last week, we also marked the two-year anniversary of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. What long was thought to be something of the past, that is, war in Europe, is now an everyday reality for Ukrainians and threatens to become a reality for all of us. The recent killing of Alexei Navalny, the most potent opponent of the Russian President Vladimir Putin, proves the ruthless repression and terror of the president and his regime. Both the advance of far-right parties in, Euro in Europe, like, for example, Germany, the Netherlands, France, Hungary, Italy, and so on, as well as the terror of the Putin regime, are a menace to the democratic world that our parents and grandparents built up after the Second World War and further built uh, up after the Cold War. And to make it more complicated, we feel threatened in our human existence by climate change, by artificial intelligence, and by the many wars that are uh, carrying on today in the Middle East, in Syria, uh, in Africa, and so on. What can we learn in this situation? Oh, I forget 
my images up. Hmm. Oh, this was the one. Okay, what can we learn from Hannah Arendt in this situation? And uh, to start with one of her first lessons, I will give you a quote um, that uh, uh, is at the end of her Origins of Totalitarianism, a book of 1951. And there she says, there remains the fact that the crisis of our time and its central experience have brought forth an entirely new form of government, which as a potentially an ever-present danger is only too likely to stay with, with us from now on. And this is about totalitarianism. Thus for her, it is a fact, a fact that happened in, Europe, in European history that um, totalitarianism emerged in our political uh, and societal uh, system. And the fact that this has happened, that totalitarianism exists as a political model, implies that it will stay, remain with us forever. And that's a very threat threatening uh, message. It implies that we have to be aware always of the danger of totalitarianism. Um, and nowadays, I would say that this danger is to a certain extent um, becoming something that really threatens our uh, worldwide model of democracy. So what can we learn from Hannah Arendt? Um, this woman that was born in 1906 near in, a, in one of the suburbs of Hanover and died in New York in 1975. She was, when she died, uh, more or less my age. And I might die, of course, this year. Uh, if you have, it, as, as you maybe have seen, I'm a shaking, I've become a shaking person uh, without any reason, without any cause. Um, but to be honest, I still hope to, uh, to have the pleasure of talking to audiences like you for a few, few, a few other uh, years. But Hannah Arendt was born in Germany, in the east, the far east of Germany. Um, uh, no, not born in Hannover, but she grew up in Kon Königsberg, which is the far east of, was, was the far east of Germany, is now Russia. Uh, and that's the city of Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. And she was only 16 when she already uh, read the three critiques of Immanuel Kant. So she was a very, very curious person who wanted to know and learn every, everything. She studied uh, philosophy, philosophy and theology uh, in Marburg, the other side of Germany, uh, did a PhD in Heidelberg uh, with Karl Jaspers and uh, uh, finished her dissertation in 1929. So she was only 23 when she finished her dissertation. In 1933, she was captured by the Gestapo in Germany and uh, was kept in prison for eight days. And after that, she fled to Paris, where she worked for a Jewish organization. And what she do, did do there is that she researched anti-Semitism uh, in business, um, uh, in the business, uh, and also in uh, social uh, organizations. And that already is her first step for what became later the first part of her origins of totalitarianism which is called anti-Semitism. Um, when the Germans invaded France, uh, the government decided to intern all the Jewish uh, refugees. So Hannah Arendt ended up in the south of France in a camp. And there she fled uh, and arrived in Lisbon. And from there, she took the boat together with her husband uh, to New York. 
after arrival, she was a stateless citizen. And statelessness is something that she has written about a lot, because you can have human rights, but if there's no state or no political community that guarantees that rights, you have no ground to stand on or to appeal to a court or whatever for your rights. So being stateless implies that you have no rights. And for her, a person has to have the right to have rights. Um, in New York, she started to write the origins of totalitarianism. Or you could say that she already started this in Germany, but um, when in New York, she worked as a journalist and she, she t compiled all the essays that she all had already written and uh, expanded it with uh, a lot of other thoughts on totalitarianism. After the publication of this book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, in 1951, um, she became a well-known person in America. Uh, her talents and um, expertise was immediately recognized. Um, in 1951, she also became a citizen of the U.S. So her statelessness ended at that time. So what can we learn from this philosopher? Or, to be honest, she wanted to be called a political thinker rather than a philosopher, because for, for her philosophy is what she learned in Germany. And uh, after writing The Origins of Totalitarianism, she thought, what I want want to do is that I understand what is happening politically with uh, our societal system, with our um, political uh, system. So what I want uh, to do this afternoon is that I kind of summarize the elements of totalitarianism that she describes in her book, um, and then I focus on the antidotes against totalitarianism. And I call them political antidotes, but also antidotes in a philosophical sense, like the concepts that she develops as an antidote to totalitarianism. And then I further elaborate on certain concepts that also um, are kind of antidotes against this totalitarianism. Um, to end my lecture with the promise that Hannah Arendt um, yeah, leaves behind for us. So it's not only um, pessimistic, but also optimistic. So the elements. Um, what Hannah Arendt wants with her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, and I would say what she wants with her entire work is to understand, in German, verstehen, to stand on, for example, the, the location where someone else stands, um, to really stand everywhere and ex uh, understand every position. But it's also a kind of wondering what happens if she looks back from New York, looks back at what happened in Germany, what happened um, from the end of the 19th century until 1945? Which events, which stories, which ideologies, which institutions brought forth the catastrophe that struck the Jewish population, but also other populations? What happened? How to understand it? And it might be easy to kind of indicate causes and say, well, that's the cause and it's very easy, you can understand, it started here and there it ends. But that's not what Hannah Arendt wants. She wants to know what the hidden layers of history are. What are the multitude of factors that contributed to this uh, emergence of uh, totalitarianism? And she uses a specific word to explain that, and that's this crystallizing process. It 
implies that this many elements, th so there's all these stories, institutions, ideologies, and so on, that they kind of are, yeah, what is it, getting interwoven and then crystallize into totalitarianism. And that makes it clear that there's not one cause, but there are many, many issues, many, many elements, um, which in a different context get a different meaning and then crystallize into total, uh, totalitarianism. You could, for example, s say that the election, uh, the success of the party of for freedom um, doesn't have much meaning in a, con in a Dutch context, because you need in the Netherlands always ma a majority decision in parliament before you can change something. So it might be that the context saves us from uh, anti-democratic tendencies. But if the context changes, for example, because in other countries, like for example, if the alternative for Germany, for uh, alternative for Deutschland in Germany um, also become the first party in, in uh, uh, Germany, um, and if that's the same in Italy, in, in the UK, and in France, Le Rassemble uh, Rassemblement um, National, um, then the context in Europe is changing. And then ideology, stories, a point of views can get a different meaning. And that's what Hannah Arendt shows that happened in the 1930s. 40s. And um, you, you might say that there's no order at all in her book, but the main el elements that she uses as parts of the book is anti-Semitism, imperialism, and totalitarianism. And I very shortly will say something about these different uh, elements. Uh, the first part uh, starts in the 19th century, and it is a a, a kind of history of anti-Semitism. And the main question that Hannah Arendt raises here is how is it possible that all these beautiful promises that the French Revolution brought, equality, freedom, fraternity, um, how come it didn't bring something good. How could it be that it brought the catastrophe and that it brought the concentration camps of the na Nazis and the work camps of the Soviets um, and that it even brought an attempt to totally eradicate one group of people. And taking this question as the lead, she describes this history and shows that uh, the Jews, uh, due to the rights that they got as citizens, um, as citizens of a nation state, they were nationalized, in, they got a national identity, um, they also wanted to assimilate uh, and they became secularized. And they thought that they would become ever more equal with all other German or uh, European citizens. But in reality, the adverse happened. And the anti-Semitism grew with the secularization and assimilation uh, of the Jews. According to Arendt, the anti-Semitism that grew in the 19th century was a modern political anti-Semitism, which she discerns from a religious anti-Semitism. So it's a specific ideology, and an ideology is always an all-encompassing story that pretends to be the key of history and to that also pretends to have the solution f of all societal problems. And it's always a, a story which has one idea and that idea uh, continues until the end. Um, this ideology um, 
in this case, that the Jews were the enemies, that they wanted to have world power, that we had to be afraid of them, um, prepared was one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways to prepare for a totalitarianism. And Hannah Arendt is not uh, very, what is it, lenient to the Jews themselves. She uh, accuses them of naivety. And uh, you will understand that after the publication of The Origins of Totalitarianism, where she at the, at the end also describes how totalitarian experiments uh, in the concentration camps had an impact on the, how Jews themselves behaved in the concentration camps, um, yeah, made uh, uh, groups of uh, Jews uh, quite angry, which uh, was enforced later by the publication of her report of the trial of Eichmann. But I'll talk about that later. So this is more or less the, the first, it's 600 pages, so it's almost impossible to, to summarize this book. But this is more or less the first part. And then uh, another preparing ground next to anti-Semitism is imperialism. And that's especially the 19th century imperialism, uh, which implies that um, European countries uh, colonized um, many countries in Africa, and I think in 80s, about 80% 80 of the 80, 90, 80% 80 of the world uh, service was, um, the, the land, of course, was uh, in possession of European countries. So the Europeans were really dominating the world, and they divided Africa among European countries, where we still see uh, the problems from today. Um, and what was strange is that in the 19th century, the most, most uh, European countries became full-blown nation states. And a nation state, what is special about a nation state, is that state, nation, and territory are uh, coinciding. coinciding. Uh, so they are uh, more or less the same. So that would mean that if you go beyond the borders of the nation state and you colonize other people, other populations, that they have to become citizens of this nation. But uh, most mother countries didn't want to do that. Um, so there came political problems overseas because also the inhabitants of the colonized uh, countries thought that they would be equal citizens, um, equal to uh, the citizens of the, of the motherland, um, which gave uh, a lot of political struggle in the 20th century. Um, something that she mentioned especially is that this um, imperialism in the first place gave a lot of wealth. Uh, there was even talk before the First World, World War of a golden age. There was so much rich, ri richness coming from imperialism. You could compare it to the globalization that we experienced uh, since the 1990s until 2008. That also was a kind of golden age. Um, but making historical parallels is, is very dangerous because you can conclude, it, uh, you can uh, make conclusions which are not correct. So I say it with a certain yeah, um, uh, 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 prudence, a certain uh, hesitation. Um, but if you look back today to what happened after the Second World War and have to, happened after the Cold War and how our econo economic system has changed, how our political landscape have, has changed, there will be certain similarities to the history that Hannah Arendt described, as well as, of course, many differences. And it's uh, the reason why I say it is to make you aware that 
there are always a lot of elements that together can crystallize in something that we maybe do not want. Um, because of this political problem that citizens overseas were not accepted as normal citizens of the nation state, um, you see that an ideology of racism is invented. The Western uh, countries, the Western citizens, uh, think themselves superior, superior to uh, the colonized uh, populations. And Hannah Arendt shows, and I mean, this is the most difficult part of the book, very dense and very uh, difficult to see what exactly her theses are. But one of the things that she says is that the racism that is developed in the col colonies is subsequently transported to uh, Europe itself. And there you see that um, the citizens in nation states think of minorities, the word itself already says it, as people who are inferior to the superior majority of a country. And if you uh, know then that in um, uh, after the, the First uh, World War, um, most, let me see if this is, yeah, this after the First World War, in the interbellity, most uh, old empires, like the Russian Empire, the German Empire, and so on, uh, had, had the Habsburg Empire had collapsed, uh, and that uh, new nation states, states were installed that couldn't defend the rights of minorities, although there were a lot of refugees after, the, after this collapse of the empires and a lot of displaced persons, um, uh, it becomes clear that the position of refugees and especially of Jewish refugees um, was, what is it, defenseless. Uh, they, they, their their um, rights were not guarantees, even guaranteed, even though after the First World War there were certain minority treaties, but the nation states couldn't defend these rights. And for Hannah Arendt, uh, this uh, makes her conclude that the nation states declined. Um, so the last part is about totalitarianism itself. Um, Arendt shows you had this preparing ground, the preparing ground of anti-Semitism, the preparing ground of imperialism, and then after World War I, there is an, a wave of anti-Semitic anti totalitarian movements. That's, I would say, is not something that we see today. Uh, we see uh, the rise of anti-Islamic parties, but uh, after, the, after the pandemic, um, the Islam is no longer uh, a, a key issue for these, these right-wing uh, political parties. Uh, it's more refugees than uh, Islam nowadays. Um, but uh, there is a wave of anti-democratic parties. And I wouldn't say that we know this as movement. It's movements. It's more parties nowadays than movements. Um, the goal of these movements is to bring into movement the masses. So the masses have uh, to move, and these masses are often the socially and economically superfluous individuals. Uh, one of the key words in this part of uh, uh, the origins of totalitarianism is loneliness. Uh, due to inflation, unemployment, uh, well, you could say today, flexible jobs, flexible uh, living, everything has become flexible. Um, the social ties between peoples have loosened. And according to Hannah Arendt, uh, loneliness, but also worldliness, so people are not rooted anymore in a specific local world, um, uh, gives the experience of being superfluous. 
And this experience of superfluity um, makes people um, open for totalitarian ideologies. It opens them up for um, populist leaders and so on. Um, and so these, these, these masses of atomized individuals have to be brought into movement and in the end to reach uh, totalitarian domination. Um, what uh, she see, sees as part of these totalitarian movements, parties uh, and uh, leaders is a mixture of lies, half truth and sincerity. And one of these lies, I already said it all, uh, to you, is that the Jews are, were the enemies and that they wanted world power, which uh, legitimized um, the terror against the Jews, uh, but it also legitimized the Nazis and the Sovje Soviets' um, own striving for world power. Well, she gives an enormous description of how um, to uh, totalitarian leaders work, um, what it implies for the people loyal to them, and, the and so on. But in the end, the terror that is uh, uh, raised by the totalitarian regime affects everyone uh, and especially everyone who resists. And you could say that what happened with Navalny is a, is a, is a kind of terror that is uh, similar to the terror that uh, Arendt saw uh, in the Nazi regime and the Soviet uh, regime. And uh, at the end, even the most loyal supporters uh, are in danger and are not safe anymore. And then the last phase uh, is uh, the dismantlement of the national state. So the state apparatus is dismantled. The, the democracy is already d d uh, dismantled. And rather than um, political leaders or government or whatever, there is a secret police who organizes everything. And then you see the rise of work camps, of concentration camps. And a complete totalitarian terror and domination. You might wonder what then is totalitarianism? The trouble is that Hannah Arendt does not give a definition of totalitarianism. That has to do with her method, her philosophical method. She's part of Germ of the German phenomenology. And uh, phenomenology is uh, not about determining the facts. No, it's about um, the way in which the world appears to us and um, how we, uh, how this appearance um, is experienced and how we um, give meaning to these experiences. So appearance is a key word in phenomenology. Um, the world appears to us, we experience that in a way, and this experience we give meaning to. That implies that her work is not a search for historical or causal links that explain why totalitarianism emerged, but it's a gathering of stories of analysis, of incidents, of, um, well, everything that she can find. And subsequently, she discovers patterns in all this, yeah, what is it, appearances. And after that, she develops concepts and theories. I wouldn't say theories, I would say that Hannah Arendt is developing concepts and not She's not making a, a, like Immanuel Kant, a really systematic uh, theory. So in her book, she doesn't define uh, totalitarianism. 
what she does do is show these main elements that crystallize into totalitarianism. And key words are this totalitarian movement, some masses that uh, of atomized individuals that submit to a, a totalitarian leader or a totalitarian regime, very, uh, very often silent or silent masses. Uh, you, could see you could, for example, say in, say in, Germ in Russia that the masses there are silenced. Uh, it's impossible to uh, resist the Putin regime. Uh, but I'm not sure whether, t whether it's allowed to call it a totalitarian movement, because I would say that many citizens do not agree but are not able to disagree. A totalitarian ideology and a totalitarian uh, government. Um, and what is happening in totalitarianism is that the masses are mobilized in the name of an ideology. And uh, it's aimed at total domination combined with a culture of hatred. And this culture of hatred uh, was the hatred against the Jews. Um, so in the Nazi regime and the Soviet uh, uh, Russian, Soviet Russia, the power was in the hands of the silenced masses, uh, which had to be loyal and there was not one party or one absolute ruler. Uh, the difference between a totalitarianism and a dictatorship or a tyranny is that in the last, um, in tyranny and dictatorship, there's one party or one ruler. And it's not especially the, the masses that uh, together are this totalitarian regime. If you would ask me if the Putin regime is totalitarian, to be honest, I don't know. It, I, I think it would need a, a very um, uh, elaborate study to really know whether it's totalitarian in the sense that Hannah Arendt uh, uses it. And Hannah Arendt's book is one of the key publications in totalitarianism studies. But um, and I, I don't know if you, if we, if you, if it's correct to call it totalitarian. I saw that the, the Carne Carnegie Institute in, uh, in uh, USA uh, called Putin a neo-totalitarian regime. And that already makes clear that history is never exactly uh, happening. Uh, a, 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 some, an incident in history is never again happening in exactly the same way. So you have to, if you would be Hannah Arendt today and you wanted to describe our current world, you have to start again. And of course, you can use the elements that Hannah Arendt uh, uh, developed, but each situation has a, has a new context and therefore has a new meaning. Um, so the rest of her oeuvre, I would say, is developing antidotes against the totalitarianism. And uh, the first antidote, um, the, the antidotes that I want um, to explain, I call them political antidotes because it's aimed at the political models, the political system. And um, Arendt calls herself a political thinker, but to be honest, she didn't really develop a political theory or a political model that would counteract totalitarianism. She had, in the 1940s, 40s, during, the first, uh, during the uh, Second World War, she was um, convinced that federalism, European federalism, would be the answer uh, after, the world, after the war. Uh, and that implied that she wanted to do away with the nation state. Because according to her, the nation state has brought uh, so many wars, so many disasters, so she wanted to get rid of it. And she wasn't the only person at that moment. Many others thought in this uh, same vein. Um, but um, it was after the 
the Second World War, the French um, um, president who uh, knew uh, to reinstall the nation state in uh, Europe. But um, I have to admit that what he did extra, or what Europe itself did extra, is that we developed um, uh, supranational organizations, or you could say federations. Of course, the UN, the United Nations, is a federation. And uh, the EU is, I don't know what it is. Is it a political unity? Is it a federation? Uh, well, I think we're in a, in a, pos in a uh, um, situation of transformation. Slowly, uh, the EU is becoming more um, a federation, but until now, it's a um, coalition of nation states. Uh, so it's, it's, but I would say it protects us against uh, the disasters of the nation state as it was in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, what she, uh, as a political thinker, pleads for also is investments in the public sphere. I'll talk about that later. And uh, to stimulate uh, the participation, the political participation of uh, citizens of all people, uh, actually. Um, Stronger than this political antidotes, uh, I would say, are her philosoph philosophical concepts um, that she develops, especially in uh, The Human Condition, a book of 1958, uh, uh, um, in which the key concepts are plurality and nat natality. In the human condition, um, which is aimed at the active life of human beings, so for her, acting, uh, living together, doing things together, is the core business of human life. And uh, it's interesting that uh, for her, the word fact is uh, used, she, r she uses very often the word fact. Uh, but it means something like factuality. Uh, if you look in the world, uh, how do human beings appear to you? They appear as persons who like to act together, and they do act together. They like to belong to communities, to neighborhoods, to uh, the world, to have a home, and so on. So. For her, this is the facts, the appearances that you can describe. Um, in the human condition, her focus is on this active life, so not uh, on the con contemplative life, but on the active life, which is the, 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 the condition uh, par excellence of uh, being human. And um, there, uh, she makes a distinction between, between uh, three things, uh, what is it, vital issues that human beings do, and that is we labor, that is we reproduce, we work, that is we fabricate all kinds of things, and we act. And action, th th this uh, activity of action, is speaking and acting together in the public sphere. Um, in this, uh, especially in this last activity, the action, the word plurality, or the concept of plurality comes up. And plurality is the fact, again the fact, that man, in plural, and not man, the man of universal rights, live on the earth and inhabit the world. So if you look around, it's not one man, we're not similar, we're plural. So it's man in plural that inhabit the world. And that implies that we're all different. We are equal in that sense that we're all different. And this human plurality is 
the basic condition of both our acting and our speaking, our speaking together. Um, and this has the factual character of equality and distinction. So we're all equal in that we're all different. That's the plurality that we as humans uh, live with. But plurality for her is not only a fact, it's also something that we have to strive for, that we have to foster. Then I come to the second uh, concept, the condition of natality. Natality is the reverse concept of mortality. Most philosophers are interested in mortality, and especially one of her uh, 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 key master philosophers, uh, Heidegger, uh, he, for him, uh, the, n the awareness that we are mortal beings, that, that, that there will be a time that we as persons are no longer present here, that we do not even exist anymore, is uh, the most essential feature of our being human. Hannah Arendt uh, changes this, and she proposes natality as one of the most vital conditions of being human. And that implies that as a human being, we are born as a unique person. No one before us, no, no one today and no one in the future will be exactly similar to what we are. All of us, we are unique persons. And that means that all of us will set in motion new processes because we are unique. And we do not do that only with our first birth, but also when we're born a second and a third and a fourth and so on time. And this second birth or a hundred birth is happening every time that we enter the public sphere. If we enter the public sphere and someone asks you, who are you? You feel inclined to respond. And it would be kind of strange if you wouldn't respond. And in responding, you explain who you are. Or you say, well, I'm standing on this side, or I'm standing, and this is my point of view. Um, at the moment that you're revealing yourself to another, that you're appearing to someone else, you are born again, and again, and again, because you set in motion new process each time that you respond to this question. And it's not only responding in a verbal sense, but also in acting, taking an initiative, um, uh, make new beginnings. For Arendt, making new beginnings is a very, very specific human condition, something that we as humans are uh, able to do. And what's interesting is that this idea didn't come because of her study on totalitarianism. No, this comes from long, long ago. Oh, I forget this one. I'm go uh, going to skip this one. It's coming from long ago from her dissertation, which she finished in 1929. And her dissertation was still written in German. All the other books are written in English. Um, and it was about Augustine, the bishop, uh, a very Christian uh, father, a church father, um, because at that moment in time, uh, the, the work of August Augustine was very popular in uh, German philosophy, and she, yeah, she was part of that, and uh, wrote a dissertation on his love concept. Um, one of the senses that pops up in this dissertation is initium ergo ut esset creatu est homo, antequem nemo fuit. That a beginning be made, man was created 
before whom there was nobody. Men are beginners. Without men, there is no beginning. So, in order to have a beginning, at the beginning of the, what is it, the, the world maybe already existed, but there was no beginning, there was no time, man was created to have a be beginning. And before that, uh, there was nobody. So, this sentence of Augustine is taken by Hannah Arendt as the most important capacity of human beings. We are beginners. We are always able to take an initiative, to do something new. Even though history has brought a lot of catastrophes, we are able to make a new beginning. And that's, of course, a very optimistic thought. And this is linked to this idea of natality. Because, because of our condition of natality, uh, we are beginners. Because we are unique um, persons who are able to start something new. Um, in the work after the human condition, but also still in the human condition, um, there are some other concepts and ideas of which I would say that they are antidotes against totalitarianism. And um, the first is uh, the public space. Uh, I'll explain more about that. The second is um, thinking. And the third is uh, the census communis. So this public space, um, she develops this uh, her uh, view on the public state space, also in the human condition, um, is what exists in between persons. And she makes a difference between the material, uh, in between the inter -esse. Uh, for example, we are gathered here, and there are a lot of materials, things like chairs, uh, uh, a cathedral, and so on, uh, that, um, that makes it possible to meet, to speak together, and to act together. But there's also a non-material interest, uh, what happens between human beings. And these both in-betweens are part of the public uh, sphere. Um, and this public sphere is, for her, the space outside of our private house where we meet each other, where we talk to each other, and where we can respond to this question, who are you? And ultimately can act together and create, in that sense, a plurality. This idea of the public space, where people meet, speak, and act together, um, is linked to her concept of freedom. And freedom, for her, is the reason of being for politics, the raison d'être of politics, and that can only uh, be achieved by acting together. So you need a public space uh, to have freedom. And uh, during the pandemic, this sentence or this idea of public space uh, made uh, that I was quite critical about what uh, European go governments did, because they closed the public sphere. And closing the public sphere is an immense um, uh, thing uh, in relation to our freedom. Because the freedom to meet, to meet strangers, to meet unknown persons, to meet people who have a different view on the world, a different standpoint, is the raison d'etre of politics. And even today, I would say we are living in a society uh, thus individualized, ever more atomized, and uh, with a lack of public spaces, uh, most cafes are uh, closing nowadays. Uh, there, there are less and less meeting um, 
uh, possibilities. Uh, a journalist, uh, a Rotterdam journalist, uh, wrote uh, not long ago that there was a kind of war against social um, uh, contact, uh, direct contact between persons. And I think he's right. The, 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 the decline of the public sphere and the decline of the sphere where you can meet and talk and act together has an enormous political impact. Then the second uh, issue, thinking. Um, Hannah Arendt shows that one of the dangers that can bring totalitarianism is the danger that people, and especially masses, do not think anymore. And she develops her concept of thoughtlessness, that you do not think and just yeah, do whatever you want, um, is developed in her report on the trial of uh, the Nazi uh, chief uh, uh, person, um, Eichmann. Uh, and in her book on him, she described, uh, which was very much against what most people thought, that Eichmann is not a was not a monster, but he was terribly normal, terribly and terrifying normal, something that many others in that position could have done. And what she refutes him <coughs> is that he is unable to think, and especially to think from the standpoint of somebody else. And there again, you see this idea of the public sphere where you meet and speak and learn the standpoints of other persons. She comes back to this idea of thoughtlessness in uh, her last book, The Life of the Mind, uh, and the first part is about thinking. And what she wonders there is that could the activity of thinking as such be among the conditions uh, that make man abstain from evil doing, or ev even actually condi condition them ad against evil doing. So thinking, which implies that you also think what, uh, think what uh, uh, s uh, experiences or appearances imply and mean for someone else could be a remedy against um, uh, totalitarianism. To explain that a little bit more, and I'm running out of time, I see, uh, in, her in the last part of the life of the mind, she connects this to the idea that uh, we have a kind of sixth sense, which is the common sense. We can share our experiences. We can share our um, perceptions. Uh, for example, if you have eaten something uh, delicious, you can say, oh, it's delicious. Yeah, say the other person said, it's delicious. And then you have a common sense about your meal. And she translates this to politics, where you can also uh, have the f share your uh, opinions or views. And by sharing them, you discover what you share with another person or wha where uh, you uh, disagree. Here, um, she introduces the idea that thinking enables you to make an image of the perspective of others. Um, you take their standpoint into account. And by doing that, you try to judge about what the other does beyond your own particular and often unreliable uh, perception. And in that sense, you try to think with others. And that's what re she refuted uh, Eichmann. He was not able to think for others or to think with others, even though he tried to be a very uh, obedient and disciplined worker, um, he didn't have any notion 
what his actions implied for the Jewish victims of his dealings. This way of thinking, Hannah Arendt calls an extended mentality, and that's a concept that she borrows from uh, Immanuel Kant. So what you see is that after the origins of totalitarianism, she doesn't develop a complete theory or a poli political system that would protect us forever against totalitarianism. What she does do is that she develops certain concepts, and if you, um, if you uh, sum them up, you see that there is a kind of theory behind it, it which implies that we have to protect our public sphere. We have to protect our participating as citizens in the democracy, in the politics. We have to um, be able and also uh, um, try to discipline ourselves to think with others, to take their point of view, to really stand at the standpoint that they have. And we have to um, uh, be aware that as human beings, we're always able to respond and always able to take an initiative and therefore to change the course of history. That brings me to, uh, my, to the end of my uh, lecture. Um, the promise that uh, Hannah Arendt um, writes down at the end of the origin is that every end in history necessary, necessary contains a new beginning. This beginning is the promise, the only message with the end, which the end can ever produce. Um, so even in Russia, even after the death of Navalny, uh, even if everything turns um, even worse in Russia or even in and, and similar in Europe, even then there will always be a new beginning. That's part of our history. That doesn't mean that we can, can uh, be relaxed. We have to be aware of thoughtlessness, aware of loneliness, of, too, of a too large individualization, of a lack of social life. We have to be aware of worldlessness. If we are all rooted and uh, hyper flexible, not binding ourselves to anything in the world, um, the, the we, we have this continuing danger of totalitarian uh, regimes. We have to remain beginners. We have to foster plurality and the multiplicity of public spheres we have to continue to act in concept and keep on making new beginnings. And I would like to end with a, a concept that Donna Haraway, the American philosopher, biologist, took from Hannah Arendt, and that's responsibility. And I would say, com combining these two thinkers, it is a fact, something that we can see as an appearance of our world. It is a fact that human beings are response-able beings, beginners, persons who can take an initiative, who can always respond to the political situation and counteract the, in this case, very anti-democratic tendencies of our time. Thank you very much.